first part um, of, a, of the webinars that cover the male reproductive system. The first part will cover the physiologic anatomy. In particular, we're talking about the various structures of the male reproductive system and their overall function. Also, we're going to be looking at gametogenesis in the male, which is specifically referred to as spermatogenesis. Before we, we start looking at the male reproductive system, let's just look at the reproductive system in general, covering both males and females. The overall functions are for gamete production, storage of them, nourish them to keep them happy, and transport them to where they need. So we're going to refer to the sperm, or you can refer to this with the oocyte. In the female, they're responsible for maintaining a developing zygote or a fetus. Males don't have to worry about that. But in both, they also have to, uh, the function of the reproductive system is the production of the sex hormones. Generically referred to in the males as the androgens, in the females referred to more as the estrogens, but also progesterone, or the progestin. Now, if we look at a proper picture of the male reproductive system, in your notes, you have a drawing that I did. I'll pull that up and label the parts for you, but I just want to show you in general overall pathway and which sperm is going to be traveling within the system. You'll notice here the sperm will be start, the production of sperm will occur in the testes. They'll make its way to the epididymis, which overlies the testes. Now, males, you have two testes, so we're only seeing one side. You have two epididymises, or epididymi, I think it's the proper term. It travels up the ductus deferens, which also refers to as the vas deferens. Eventually makes its way into here, into the ejaculatory duct, and combines with fluid released from the seminal vesicles. And we have, the males have two seminal vesicles, one on either side. It also mixes with secretions from the prostate gland. There's only one prostate gland. You also have secretions from the bulbourethral glands in the male. And they make their way down through the urethra, and we have different components of the urethra depending on where you're located. We do have a prostatic urethra because it's located around the prostate gland. You have a membranous urethra, and then you have a penile urethra in the male. Then you look, then you, and so eventually then it makes its way out of here. So if we look at the picture that I drew, I have them labeled for you. So you'll notice here's the testes again, epididymis. This whole structure here is the vas deferens. This where it kind of expands out is referred to as the ampulla of the vas deferens. Here's a seminal vesicle, prostate gland in the blue, bulbourethral gland. This whole thing is the urethra, and obviously this is the penis. So here's the, my drawing. Now, we're going to start looking, start at the testes. Now the testes have two functions. Exocrine function would be sperm production. Its endocrine function is the production of androgens. Specifically, you think of testosterone. So it serves overall two functions. But if we look at the testes in section, you'll notice the testes, and here's you get two of them. Inside the testes, you have these seminiferous tubules here. The seminiferous tubules, and I spelled this wrong, this should be an I right over here. The seminiferous tubules, the overall function of it, this is where the sperm will be produced within the seminiferous tubules. You'll notice that the testes are kind of contained, not kind of, they are, contained in a scrotal sac in the scrotum. The purpose of the scrotum, or some of the purposes or functions, the testes are possessed outside of the body in the scrotal sac. So why must they, the testes lay outside the body? Well, one, most, a lot of people would, could think about it. They're going to say their response will be, which I've had a lot, is temperature regulation. Mm, that would be incorrect. Because if you say temperature regulation to me, you're telling me 
that it's responsible for the regulation of my body temperature. It isn't. Its function is to keep the testes two to three degrees cooler than the core body temperature. So it has to lay outside of the body so it stays a little bit cooler than the core body temperature because proper sperm development, the optimum is a little bit cooler than what the core body temperature. So if you want to be uh, fertile, that sperm production needs to be a little bit cooler than the body temperature. Well, what, what's the purpose of the cremaster muscle? Well, the cremaster muscle can pull the testes up closer to the body or lower it, move it away further from the body depending on how the temperature it is. If it's too cold outside, it's going to pull it up a little bit closer to the body. If it's too warm, it's going to drop it a little bit more. So this, again, is the job is to try to, again, control where that testes is located to maintain proper temperature for sperm production. Now here's another reason a lot of people don't think about why is another reason why we have the testes in the scrotum. Well, if the testes were not in the scrotum, which again is located outside of the body, it's not readily accessible in a physical exam. You're like, well, who cares? Well, the most common solid tumor in males starting from after puberty to age 40 is testicular cancer. So the best way to detect this is very easily treatable cancer if detected early. And to detect it early, you have to do self-exam. So it's readily available for self-exam if the testes is located outside the body. So there's another reason why you'd want it outside the body. Now if we look at my drawing or section through the testes. Here, you're seeing section through the seminiferous tubule. So if you notice, within the seminiferous tubules, we're going to have various cells that will be responsible for normal spermatogenesis or required for spermatogenesis. So you'll notice we have various spermatogenic cells. The spermatogenic cells are the cells that eventually give rise to the sperm cells. And the sperm development occurs from outside in. Because you'll notice here, these little dudes with the little tails or dudettes, these are the spermatozoa. So these are going to be the ones that eventually, once they're mature, will be ejaculated. Now you'll also notice that within the seminiferous tubules, you have these pink cells, these very large pink cells. They're Sertoli cells or sustenticular cells. Sometimes they're referred to as nurse cells, but the proper name is, are called, they're called Sertoli cells. Their jo overall job is to support and nourish the developing sperm. So that's why they call them nurse cells. We're going to go through a, lot, a number of different things also that the Sertoli cells do, but then you notice they're right there where those developing sperm cells are. Now, outside the seminiferous tubules, you also have these cells that I have in purple. These are the Leydig cells, or referred to the interstitial cells of Leydig. They're responsible for androgen production. So in the, in the testis, within the seminiferous tubules, we have sperm development. Outside the seminiferous, seminiferous tubules, but still within the testis, you have the Leydig cells. So the Leydig cells produce testosterone. Now the testosterone produced by these Leydig cells will be very important in normal sperm development as well as when we talk about the male's secondary sexual characteristics. The Sertoli cell, we kind of zoomed in here on the Sertoli cells, the pink cells that I had in the previous slide. And here are the developing sperm cells. Now the, the sperm, or the Sertoli cells serve a number of different functions. We had mentioned earlier that it helps to support spermatogenesis. They will secrete various factors that will help in the development going from the spermatogonia eventually to the, sp the spermatozoa. The, they also secrete, I'll skip, I'll come back to these two, they also secrete something called malarian inhibiting substance. This is a substance 
that is secreted during fetal life. What it does is it causes regression of the malarian ducts, which eventually in, the, in a female would become the uterine tubes in the uterus. But as long as enough testosterone is being produced the, and the Sertoli cells are functioning properly, this malarian inhibiting substance will be secreted, which helps to cause regression of the malarian ducts. Now, inadequate secretion of this could lead to retention of these malarian ducts and also lead to something called cryptorchidism, where the testes fail to descend into the scrotum. The Sertoli cells also serve as, maintain, or I should say, maintains a blood testes barrier. So it's the, it keeps the sperm separate from the blood. It produces or secretes a lot of different factors that support those sperm cells, but as well as prevent immune system cells from attacking them, thinking of them as foreign so they would attack it. So it forms a blood testes barrier. It also secretes androgen binding protein. So that's pretty self-explanatory. It binds to androgen. Why do you need that? Well, what it'll do is bind to the androgens being produced by those Leydig cells heavily concentrates it in the area where you need sperm development because you need a very high concentration locally of androgens for normal development of the sperm. What also is needed for normal development of the sperm are estrogens. So aromatase is an enzyme found in Sertoli cells whose job is to convert testosterone to estrogen. And the estrogens are also involved in spermatogenesis. The Sertoli cells also secrete another hormone called inhibin. So considering the name of it, you know it has to inhibit something. Well, inhibin inhibits FSH. So why would you want something that inhibits FSH? What it does, it kind of keeps spermatogenesis in check. If spermatogenesis is advancing too rapidly, Inhibin will be, increased levels of inhibin will be released, which inhibits the effects of FSH, which is needed for normal sperm development too. Now you also notice on this picture, you kind of can see the transition from the primitive germ cell, the spermatogonia, eventually to the spermatozoa. Now males are born with a finite number of spermatogonia. But the cells will undergo mitosis repeatedly, starting about puberty. These cells will undergo mitosis repeatedly, which gives males the capacity to pr produce sperm for an indefinite period of time. So what happens is, when this undergoes mitosis, you've got a backup. So you always have a backup. One of the spermatogonia, referred as maybe as the daughter cell, will, or not, uh, uh, well, they're both technically daughter cells, but one will stay as a stem cell. The other will move towards the lumen and develop eventually into the sperm. You'll see here, you have one sperm develops into a primary spermatocyte, one sp primary spermatocyte, and then goes what we call meiosis one. You, the one spermatocyte will divide into two secondary spermatocytes. Meiosis II will also be completed. Finally, it's actually not finally, but each secondary spermatocyte will divide and you'll end up with, or divide and you get two for each secondary spermatocyte. So eventually what you'll notice, one spermatogonia ends up producing four spermatids. And each of the spermatids are haploid. They have half the number of chromosomes that you would need in a normal diploid zygote. Now, the, the spermatids will undergo a process called spermiogenesis. And don't worry, it is written in your notes in bold. It will undergo a process of spermiogenesis, so eventually it gets its tail and all its proper structures for motility in the in the Female GI, female GI tract. So you get from start with one spermatogonia and you end up with four spermatozoa. This whole process is spermatogenesis, 
but we can kind of say from here to here, this subset referred to as spermiogenesis. Now think big picture. Why do we want this? The whole cornerstone of sexual reproduction is to have two gametes, the sperm and the oocyte, meet together. They each will contribute half the number of chromosomes to produce a diplozygote. So this one sperm has half the amount of chromosomes that would be needed. The other half is in the egg, and when they unite, we'll end up with the proper number of chromosomes. Now, this picture kind of shows you the process of spermiogenesis. So you have your spermatid, and eventually through a number of different, very energetically costly process, eventually you get your one spermatozoan, plural would be spermatozoa. And if you look at the different parts of the sperm, you have the tail, okay, which is a flagella, obviously helps with motility. You have this central piece here, has a lot of mitochondria, you need that for energy to fuel this whole process. You have the head, within the head you have the nucleus, this contains the chromosomes, and overlying the head you have this acrosomal cap. Now the acrosomal cap, I think, think of it as a helmet, it contains enzymes that will be inter integrally important or they have a huge function in being able to penetrate the coat that surrounds a uh, ovulated egg in order to get fertilization. It contains an enzyme hyaluronidase, which digests proteoglycan filaments like hyaluronic acid. It digests proteins because you need to get through these layers of the egg to, in order to fertilize it. Now this whole process, if I go back here, this whole process that you see here takes somewhere between 60 to 74 days for this whole process to occur, which is kind of amazing. But remember, starting at puberty, guys, are start, this process was going, so you're like, oh my gosh, you're starting from scratch each day. Now you are constantly producing sperm every day at this point, but when you start with one spermatogonia, going to the spermatozoa, it takes over a couple months to do. So this is something to keep in mind. If you have a fever or an illness that perhaps could impair fertility, damage them, that it may take about three months after that illness or fever to get your fertility back. So something to keep in mind. Now there are a number of factors that are required for normal spermatogenesis in regards to hormones. And I have added an additional one down here. So this one is not in your notes, but we'll get to it in a moment. But these other, one, other ones are listed in your notes. Now testosterone, definitely important, but it's locally produced testosterone and that testosterone is produced by the Leydig cell, which you see here, in response to the actions of luteinizing hormone. The luteinizing hormone receptor is located on the Leydig cell in the male. Luteinizing hormone is gonadotropin secreted by the anterior pituitary. Remember what controls LH secretion. It is gonadotropin-releasing hormone from the hypothalamus. So LH is released in the male, it binds to the Leydig cell through its second messenger systems, which involves cyclic AMP, so it's a plasma membrane receptor. You'll have an increased production of testosterone. Some of that top testosterone is going to be released into the bloodstream and responsible for the male secondary sexual characteristics. But also some of it stays and is going to be used and heavily concentrated in the seminiferous tubule because remember the Sertoli cell produces this androgen binding protein, binds to it and keeps it heavily concentrated here. Also, remember the Sertoli cell contains aromatase. So the aromatase can convert testosterone T3 
to estrogen, and the estrogen also should also not just be over here, can be, is needed over in the seminiferous tubule for normal sperm development. Now follicle stimulating hormone stimulates the Sertoli cell. So its binding site is on the Sertoli cell. So think of it why you would want it on the Sertoli cell. Follicle stimulating hormone. This helps support the development of the follicle, in this case, the sperm. Sertoli cell's job is to secrete a number of different factors, nutrients, androgen binding protein, a laundry list of things that help with normal development of the sperm. So the FSH receptor is on the Sertoli cell. FSH, like LH, is secreted by the anterior pituitary again under the control of gonadotropin releasing hormone. Growth hormone is also an important hormone in spermatogenesis. Growth hormones, basically normal metabolism, including the testes. So growth hormone is a number of target sites. So growth hormone uh, deficiency can impair fertility also. The last one, which is not in your notes, you're gonna have to add this, is Prolactin. Now prolactin, what prolactin does is it allows the, or I should say increases the, the sensitivity of the LH receptor in the Leydig cell and makes it better, or I should say makes it better, that doesn't sound right, increases the um, production of testosterone. So prolactin has an effect in males. So we had, we purposely, I purposely did not discuss this um, when we first discussed prolactin because most people think of its effects on the female, but it also affects the male by increasing the sensitivity of the luteinizing hormone receptor. Now the epididymis is the next step, or, or should I say, yeah, the next step in where the sperm will move. So the sperm are going to be developing here in the, in the seminiferous tubules within the testes. They make their way eventually into the epididymis, which overlies the testes. The epididymis job, primary job, is, is to help the sperm mature. Think of the sperm produced in the seminiferous tubules as babies and toddlers. In the epididymis, you think of it maturing into teenagers and young adults. There is a small amount is stored here, but most of it is not stored in the epididymis. Most of it's stored in the vas deferens. So the main function of the epididymis is to help in the maturity of the sperm cells. Once it leaves the epididymis, it will travel through the vas deferens. Here you see another different view, so you can see both of them, the ductus deferens or the vas deferens. The vas deferens, vas deferens is lined by smooth muscle. So when you have smooth muscle contraction, it will help to propel that sperm down through the vas deferens. The vas deferens main functions are storage of the sperm, and the site in which you start propelling sperm during ejaculation. This is the site where if a male has a vasectomy, they tie off, they, they cut and tie off the tube during, for, a vet, for a vasectomy as a, as a means of birth control. Now after the sperm leave the ductus deferens, it's going to enter the ejaculatory duct here, and it's going to mix with secretions from the seminal vesicles. We have two seminal vesicles. They're paired. This the structure secretes fluid that's very, it's pretty alkaline. It's got a lot of fructose. That fructose is used for energy. Sperm preferentially use fructose rather than glucose for energy. And a lot of people don't re realize, well, why did they, they choose fructose? Well, think of it on their 
their uh, journey. They're going to be fighting for nutrients with bacteria. Bacteria will use the glucose. They are like, I got to keep these sperm happy. So I don't want to have any competition here. So I'm going to have my fructose. And the seminal vesicle actually is the site where fructose is produced in the male from glucose. They convert glucose to fructose within the seminal vesicle. That fructose is not derived from dietary. So if you consume a lot of fruit, sugar, the, the fructose need that's released by the seminal vesicle is not from there. The seminal vesicle makes its own fructose from glucose. So the fructose is a source of energy. It being alkaline helps to regulate the pH of the contents. The sperm are going to be active, producing acids, which can make them not so happy. So you kind of kind of have to keep that pH in check. Plus, as it moves up through the female reproductive tract, which is acidic, it helps to kind of keep that pH not get, not getting too low. So it helps to kind of think of it, kind of almost think of it as a buffer. It also contains prostaglandins, which help to stimulate muscle contractions within the female reproductive tract to help to kind of move it to the proper location. So the sperm enters the ejaculatory duct, mixes with the fluid contents from the seminal vesicle. It's also going, then it enters the urethra and gets the contents from the prostatic or the prostate gland. The prostate gland also is a alkaline fluid. It has, um, it's, they say it's kind of milky, but it's more alkaline, kind of again, kind of keep the pH in check. Um, and then it will enter the across the membranous urethra into the pre, the penile urethra, and the one I'm missing here, got to find it. Where'd it go? We're missing the bulbar urethral gland. Where are you, bulbar? There you are. The, here's the bulbar urethral gland. The bulbar urethral glands, the secretions from there is actually the first to enter the urethra during an ejaculation, because the bulbar urethral glands secrete a fluid that's more of a lubricant, plus it helps to cleanse the urethra of any urine, since males have a common pa uh, pathway for urine as well as sperm. So the, the urine can be very acidic, and so that could harm the sperm. So we want to cleanse the urethra of any urine that's been there, and then act as a lubricant. And then this, all the secretions, will eventually go through the urethra and outside and out of the penis into the female reproductive tract. Now, the seminal fluid, the reason why we say semen or seminal fluid has its name is because the majority of the secretions come from the seminal vesicle. That's why they gave the name seminal fluid. A typical ejaculation is only it's about two to five mils, but it contains millions of spermatozoa for every mil. 50 to 130 million per mil. And you're like, wow, that's a lot. And what you might find surprising is that if your sperm count is less than 20 million per mil, they say it makes the chances of impregnation improbable, considered to be infertile. If you have less than 20 million sperm per mil, you're like, you only need one, but for some reason you need a whole bunch to increase your chances. So there's a lot of sperm for every mill of ejaculate. Now that sperm can live anywhere from 24, 48, some places I've heard 72, but that's going to be some super sperm. It can live, once it's ejaculated, outside the male reproductive tract for about one or two days, which may be kind of important when you're trying to time if you want to get pregnant, time around when the woman is is ovulating. So you can, you can um, have intercourse prior to ovulation because the, the sperm will live enough long enough that after the woman ovulates, then you can have fertilization. Obviously, sperm can live weeks within the male reproductive tract. Now, once the sperm leaves, I want to take you on a trip. Okay, Overall, kind of what the sperm's quest is. So we're saying sperm leaves, quest is for fertilization of the egg. There's a number of things that need to take place. 
something called capacitation, an acrosomal reaction, and a cortical reaction. I have a video that someone again, I thought she did a really good job. This girl did a job kind of giving you overall what is involved, and she uses candy to depict this. As I thought it was very, very good to kind of give you what we need you to know. Overall, before we look at the video, capacitation, think of it as the sperm has to get ready. It's not quite ready. So it's got to get ready to be able to release its acrosomal content to penetrate the egg. That's capacitation. It's like it's putting on its tux or doing whatever. Getting ready for the, 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 uh, its quest. Acrosomal reaction involves release of the acrosomal content and penetration of the egg. The last one is the cortical reaction. Purpose of the cortical reaction is to prevent polyspermy. You only want one sperm to make it into the egg. So let's watch this video. Oh, let's see if we can do it. Well, we're not going to watch this video right now. What we'll do is we'll take a break. Once I get my internet connection, we'll do what we'll have a se second um, webinar that has the spermatozoans quest.